Good morning, everybody. So it is my great pleasure to open the defense by Mohamed Olais, material design and optimization of thermal management materials based on boron nitrate, graphene, and carbon nanotubes, polymer nanocomposites. So in the beginning, let us let me uh, just introduce the jury members. So could you? Uh, Change the slide. Okay, so first of all, it's me. Yeah. So uh, my name is Albert Nesibur, and I'm a professor at uh, Skolkov Institute of Science and Technology. So um, yeah, working at the Center for <clears throat> Photonic Science and Engineering. So until December 2022, so I was uh, an adjunct professor at Alta University, so in Finland. So nowadays, uh, so I'm uh, uh, working uh, only so in Moscow. So my main topic of the research is aerosol synthesis of nanomaterials. So uh, I am a co-founder of like a few companies and uh, so that's practically it. So the next uh, jury member is um, Alexander Karsunsky. He's a professor at Center of Digital Engineering, Skoltech. So he got his uh, degree of Doctor of Philosophy at Merton College, Oxford. Then, uh, so following the um, undergraduate education in theoretical physics, his current uh, appointment is a professor of engineering science at the University of Oxford and Trinity College. So he is a specialist in engineering uh, microscopy of materials and structures for optimization of design, durability, and performance. So Professor Krasunsky's research interest concerns uh, developing uh, improved understanding of integrity and reliability of engineered and natural structures and systems from high performance metallic alloys, polycrystalline ceramics to natural hard tissue such as human dentin and seashell narc. So I think uh, his uh, experience would be beneficial for our jury. So the next one is uh, Igor Shishkovsky. So he is a principal research scientist at Lebedev Physical Institute of, of Russian Academy of Sciences. So he used to be an, an associate professor at uh, Skolkov Institute of Science and Technology. He received his PhD from uh, Lebedev Physical Institute of Science uh, of Russian Academy of Sciences in 1992 and Doctor of Science from the Institute of Structural Microkinetics and uh, Material Science of Russian Academy of Science in 2005. Um, so his current research are additives manufacturing of functional parts, 3D biofabrication of implants uh, and scaffolds and laser treatment of materials. I think uh, his uh, experience cannot be overestimated for, for the defense. So we, Going further, the next jury member uh, also online is uh, Professor Yun Zhao. So at the National Center for Nanoscience and Technology, uh, University of Chinese Academy of Sciences. So Yun Zhao got his PhD degree from Institute uh, of Chemistry, Chinese Academy of Sciences. He has been engaged in fundamental research and uh, industrial development of polymer-based macro nanocomposite materials. So he has published more than 90 papers and uh, uh, I think uh, he, his contribution to the defense uh, will be very important. And the last but not least uh, jury member is a uh, professor Queen Liu, um, professor in College of Aerospace uh, Engineering and uh, at the Nanyang University of Aeronautics and Astronautics. So he got uh, his so research, his research associate at the School of Mechanical, Electrical, and Manufacturing Engineering in Laiboro University, UK, followed by postdoctoral research at the Department of materials engineering, so in Leuven in Belgium. So his main focus on modeling uh, of the mechanical properties, behavior of uh, lightweight composite 
metallic uh, materials and porous media. So Dr. Leo is currently working on bio-inspired design. And uh, so I also uh, thank uh, Professor Kwang Liu for joining the jury member to uh, evaluate the uh, PhD, uh, which was supervised by uh, Professor uh, Sergei Abaimov. So he's a supervisor, uh, professor at the Center for Petroleum Science and Engineering Center. So he got his Master of Science degree uh, with honor in physics from MIPT and his PhD from uh, University of California, Davis. So his uh, main interest is focused on the fundamental and applied research in the area of theoretical, computational, and experimental micro and nanomechanics. And so finally, I'm glad to introduce our candidate whom uh, everybody knows already. So Mohamed Owais, doctoral candidate. So he did his graduation with uh, Bachelor's of Science, um, four years in nanoscience and technology um, from the Preston Institute of Nanoscience and Technology uh, from Islamabad, Pakistan. During his research, so he investigated the role of nanotechnology in applications related to industries in sports sector. So now uh, he is a fourth year uh, PhD student, so defending his uh thesis which i'm very glad to announce uh, to give not longer than 40 minutes presentations to introduce us about your results yes please I have your permission to start, Professor? Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, so, dear uh, distinguished uh, jury members, professors, and uh, people from Skoltech, especially from the HR department, I uh, say good morning to everyone. So today, uh, I'm here to present my doctoral thesis uh, with the topic entitled as Material Design and Optimization of Thermal Management materials based on boron nitride, graphene, and carbon nanotubes based polymer nanocomposites. So before I start, I would first like to discuss the table of content. First, I will introduce the, uh, the introduction about the, uh, my work and the application of the work. I mean, the problems that are, they are lacking. And my PhD roadmap from my first year to final year, my research projects, uh, chapter, and the last but not the least, the conclusion part. So polymer nanocomposites have been used extensively in various applications, specifically in electronic industry, automotive industry, and aerospace industry. But particularly, I focus on thermally conductive polymer nanocomposite with the focus on thermal management application, basically on the uh, cell phones, uh, heat dissipation characteristic. So the problem arises that whenever uh, we have like, uh, some electronic devices, like I have this cell phone. So when you use this cell phone for quite a longer period of time, then there is a significant uh, dissipation of, uh, I mean, there is, there is a significant amount of heat release that may damage your brain and that may damage your nervous system. So it is extremely pertinent that you should uh, ex uh, dissipate this uh, energy as soon as possible so if not, then this heat cannot be, uh, it will be like concentrated in very small areas, creating local hotspots with extremely high temperatures, so which can negatively impact the performance and lifespan of microelectronic devices leading to printed circuit board failure, high degree of malfunction or short circuit in powerful semiconductor chips and ICs. Hence, we come to the solution that there is an urgent, uh, urgently need to fabricate those materials which can rapidly dissipate heat energies as fast as possible. So for that, we need thermal management materials. These thermal management materials are categorized into two subcategories. One is thermal interface materials. The other is underfill materials. Thermal interface materials known as TIMS 
are classified into thermoplastic and elastomers, whereas underfilled materials are classified into uh, thermoset polymer like epoxy resin. So, what are thermal management uh, materials? Like TIMS, thermal interface material, are the material that is inserted between two parts. One is the heat source, that is basically your motherboard, I mean, the area where the heat is, uh, I mean, uh, is generated. And the other is the heat sink, it's a heat distribution device. Here, uh, here you can see that, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it is like a typical representation of this thermal interface material where you have a, a system in which you, do, you don't have this thermal interface material. And then there, there is like tiny gaps between uh, the, I mean, the heat sink and the motherboard. Whereas if you put uh, this steam inside this uh, material, then there is the tiny gaps are filled, uh, which uh, leads to, I mean, uh, conducting thermal path of uh, dissipated heat energy. Moreover, if you see uh, the uh, underfill materials, uh, these are the materials that are placed uh, inside uh, just beneath the just, uh, chip and the substrate. They are typically based on uh, epoxy resin, thermally conductive epoxy resin system. They are, that, that are placed uh, in this system. So there is a, so when you have the system uh, where you can just uh, put like uh, some, uh, uh, you can just put that uh, epoxy inside and put it here. It can be, it can be used as encapsulation for, uh, uh, for, and also it can be used as an adhesive material that can connect, uh, uh, have the connecting parts for the dissipation of heat. So these applications are mostly basically used in personal computers, antennas, military equipment. So uh, uh, teams are different type of, uh, they, they, can, they, can they can be categorized into different uh, types. One is thermal pads, the other is thermal films, thermal grease and thermal interface tape and thermal paste. But you see that things are classified into, uh, divided into many sections, but most of the work has been done in the computer segment, and it is, it is the largest application due to the increasing use of team in CPU and GPU of computers. So what is my research objective? My research objective is to investigate uh, different thermally connective fillers like graphene, uh, carbon, nanotube, carbon nanotubes, and boron nitride, and various thermoset and thermoplastic polymer to study the thermal and electrical properties of polymer composite based on their morphological structure and mechanism involved. Then, to achieve the maximum improvement in thermal connectivity of uh, DMMs compared to the traditional terms that is employed in the industry that typically use four per watts per meter Kelvin of, of thermal connectivity, by investigating the fact of low to optimum fill and loading concentration within a polymer matrix. So as we know that the filler uh, nanomaterials are extremely expensive, so our objective is to uh, develop a scalable, economically viable fabrication matter for things with you. And last but not least, uh, augmentation of the thermal connectivity of polymer composites, which can be achieved by using various uh, techniques and methods, including a self-assembly of uh, fillers within polymers, reducing the filler material like graphene oxide and ut utilizing the most suitable mixing matter. So if you see the literature, we see that most of the people that, uh, researchers that are doing working have used a system called vacuum assisted filtration technique. And, and by using this technique, they have actually aligned their fillers inside and, and then they tend to peel off this uh, film uh, to get this high thermal connectivity. But in this, uh, uh, Literature, you see that they have used quite a high filler loading concentration of more than 50% to achieve, like, let's suppose, uh, 11 watts per meter Kelvin. And in another research, they have achieved the thermal connectivity of 7.3, but they use very high loading concentration. Similarly, more other researchers have had the same trend. They achieved the high thermal connectivity of 6.9, but they use like almost 94% of, pol of uh, boron nitride. So the idea was so that people are using high filler loading concentration and low filler loading concentration. So uh, if you use the high filler loading concentration, then there is a probability, big probability that it, the film will be turned into brittle uh, instead of uh, have the ductility behavior. This is due to the fact that they have uh, the higher filler loading concentration induced agglomeration inside the polymer system. Wherever, if you use uh, low filler loading concentration, you can achieve to uh, uh, lower thermal conductivity, not, uh, not as high compared to the Indian literature, but uh, uh, you can gain the uh, necessity flexibility that you require. 
So the idea is to use low to optimum film filler loading consolidation in polymer composites. It has several advantages. It's very cost effective. Obviously, if you use a lower consolidation of filler, then it can be very cost effective if you see the larger picture in terms of industry usage. And whatever, uh, if you want to improve the mechanical properties, like when you see uh, flexibility, it is a great uh, use and the material does not get brittle, uh, especially if you use high uh, filler loading consolidation. And then uh, better processibilities. I mean, if you, the filler content is quite low, you have your, uh, your mixing homogeneous mixing is, is highly uh, possible. And then the last but not the least, reduction in the weight, which is very important if you want to uh, have uh, application in, uh, applications such as aerospace and automotive industries. So my thesis roadmap consists of thermally conductive polymer nanocomposites based on thermoset and thermoplastic polymers. Uh, in thermoset polymers, I use epoxy resin as an underfill material with the use of carbon nanotubes where at very low fill loading consideration. Whereas in thermoplastic, uh, I use uh, polyvinyl alcohol as a thermoplastic with uh, first initially used as aerogel. Then after we came across some drawbacks, we converted into some films to achieve the desired uh, properties. So first, I would like to discuss the chapter one of my, this is called thermally conductive 3D boron nitride based PVE framework nanocomposites. So fabrication of uh, this 3D, uh, uh, I mean, structure, the purpose is that uh, to get, I mean, uh, because in 3D structure, we have high, uh, uh, high uh, uh, thermal transfer efficiency. So, uh, and aerogel, for example, that can be used before as an insulating material to convert, I mean, to transform from thermally insulated to thermally conducting material. In this regard, we use boron nitride platelets. So boron nitride, as you all know, that they are highly thermally thermally conductive, which thermal conductivity for more than ranges about 600 to 2000 watts per meter Kelvin. And they're also very electrically insulative. So this is very pertinent when you want to use this application where electrical insulation is required for thermal management application. In my project, I use like a PBA and then I use some uh, plasticizer to have and use some uh, plasticity inside the uh, inside the framework uh, 3D uh, aerogels. And by using this vacuum ass assisted filtration technique, uh, here you can see. So I actually uh, align, uh, not align, but self assemble the platelets with, with the use of pressure gradient. And uh, by applying the pressure gradient and the liquid is sucked, the, sucked down <coughs> to the process and uh, uh, the uh, boron nitride platelets uh, are self assembled by pi pi attraction. And then you have this uh, self assemble boron nitride PVA polymer with segregated network. So this is the fabrication technique. Initially, I uh, uh, for surface modified boron nitride by hydrolysis to uh, induce some hydro hydroxyl groups on the surface of on edges of boron nitride. Similarly, uh, for, uh, PVA and uh, uh, PVA polymers was uh, synthesized, and then they were like added drop wise to induce this uh, system in vacuum assisted filtration technique. So then uh, we have this uh, Vivian PVA aerogel. So uh, when fabricating the, these aerogels, we use different stoichiometric ratios with boron nitride to PVA, with one uh, 9 to 1, 9 to 3, and 2 to 1. And in the results of thermal conductivity, we feel that boron nitride based aerogel with 0.76 watts per meter Kelvin uh, aerogel with uh, 2 to 1 ratio achieved the best uh, thermal conductivity of 0 0.76 and 0 0.61 watts per meter Kelvin in uh, in plane and out of plane thermal conductivity. Obviously, the vacuum system filtration initiate the platelet self assembly as a process. So when you see the mechanism, we see that the boron nitride uh, nanoplatelets are ab absorbed on the surface of uh, each other by piper stacking, and then there is a self assembly of BN in the PVA polymer segregated system. So here you see that there is a uh, continuous transfer of uh, heat from one part to the, to an, to the another part. <coughs> Similarly, if, it's, if you see the XRD analysis, see a slight change of orientation of fillers, which can be seen by the, uh, the, uh, the, the friction patterns of, uh, I mean, um, the disappearance of the, the friction patterns of uh, uh, 100 and 004 uh, peak, which is reduced for the composite. 
which results from the random polygonal orientation of BN platelets and use the FA. So there are more uh, pictures of SEM, microstructure of a uh, horizontally self-assembled uh, BN platelets inside PVA composite system. So apart from self-assembly, other factors such as homogeneous mixing, vacuum grinding, and polishing the samples, they have closed the gap between the these fillers in the system. So, <coughs> sorry. When you compare with the uh, SEM structure of Borona try to PVA 2 to 1 ratio to 9 to 1, we see that in uh, 9 to 1 ratio, you see a uh, lot of agglomeration and clustering of entanglement of BN nanoplatelets. As we discussed in the, uh, in the thesis, that it shows some brittle behavior. <coughs> so, hence, we can conclude that high thermal connectivity does not depend only on the BN content, but on the optimal ratio and the structuring on the narrow level. Uh, when you compare it to electrical resistivity properties, we say that uh, uh, in the introduction of boron nitride in PVA composite system increased electrical resistivity and uh, against the high insulation range of this material. So compared to the vertibility, vertibility is extremely important when you want to use your um, system in, uh, 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 in electronics uh, gadgets where you don't want your system to be uh, hydrophilic in nature. So don't want your system to rust and have short circuiting. So here you see the, all that, all the uh, ratios of B and P and system all have increased water contact angle. Whereas pure B and doesn't have any have, have absorption capacity. <coughs> so if you see the index analysis, Compared the pure BN system to the composite system in a segregated structure, we see an, an increase in <coughs> carbon content as well as oxygen content with the induction of polymers. Whereas even in the FTIR analysis, you see that there is a peak broadening in the carbon oxygen bond and there is a white stretching at P484 uh, per centimeter. But as if you see uh, the thermal stability, which is very important when you want to like uh, increase the temperature, use the system at high temperature. You see that the pure polymer degrades at uh, uh, 295 at one percent degradation temperature, whereas PMPV doesn't degrade till 800 degrees Celsius because of the fact that the uh, boron nitride is boron nitride is highly thermally stable at high temperatures. So here we can include that. Uh, we acquired that strategy uh, in TC 3D composite system with different ratios. And we uh, concluded that it, that the increase in thermal connectiveness does not only depend on the quantity of BN, but also particle part, particle transfer by self-assembly and bridging effect of polymer to the segregated filler network. And dropping a content to ratio of 2 to 1, it did not in, absorb a significant change in term, uh, thermal connectivity relative to 9 to 3. The fact that uh, the optical ratio and structuring of the narrow level is more important. Our system uh, has uh, composite uh, with good hydrophobicity in water, thermal stability, and high uh, uh, electrical insulation. So that became me good for the thermal management application. But still, uh, apart from this property, uh, we had some limitation and shortcoming. One prominent drawback was that it lacked mechanical flexibility and it used quite a high frenologic insulation of more than 66 weight percent. So then we thought that we should transfer, this should be transition from bulky 3D structure to the thermally connective films, which are more flexible and which, which can reduce this traffic. <coughs> Sorry. So my chapter two, uh, is composed of thermally connective reduced graphene oxide polymer films. So what I did that I successfully reduced graphene oxide and then I used different graphene oxide and reduced graphene oxide metro creators signed PBA polymer to have introduced flexible strata for composite for industry. It is very low cost and its uh, fabrication methods is very easy in, for large industrial scale. 
So <clears throat> I use diethylene glycon as a reducing agent to uh, use graphene oxide. And uh, graphene uh, has, you all know, has very high thermal conductivity, more than 5,000 watts per meter Kelvin. With the uh, average particle size of one microbiter, it increases the thermal conductivity to such a level. So for the preparation and methodology, uh, graphene oxide was reduced by hydrothermal reaction matter. And by this matter, uh, matter uh, it induced self-assembly. And after the same assembly, I mean, the polymers, like they were the composite system were pressed for 10 minutes at a high, high, high force to have to remove the bubbles and vacancies, I mean, the, vac the defects from the system. So what's the evidence of reduction of graphene oxide? So our FTR system seeing an increase in CH2 bond, whereas if you see the UV visible spectrometry, you see that there is a, a, a after the, I mean, if you see the <laughs> simple graphene oxide, you see there is like uh, two peaks, so two, one, one to one nanometer and three and a, uh, nanometer. So this one is it's, it's like the electronic transition from pi bond, uh, point to uh, pi antibody transition for carbon-carbon bond. And then you see there is like a, uh, uh, there is a, like a peak, a peak uh, 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 transition of uh, carbonyl bond of 300 and 300 nanometer. So this, uh, 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 so when you reduce the graphene oxide, you see there is a complete uh, uh, elimination of this uh, shoulder peak. Moreover, if you go to the Raman spectroscopy, you see that there is like <clears throat> there is like a G, G band and there is like a D band. G band represents the sp2 structure, where D band represents the defect concentration. So, so when you take the ratio of ID to ID ratio, you see there is a decrease in the ratio to 0.13 from 0.57 when you reduce your uh, graphene side filler. <clears throat> so. Uh, we can conclude that after the reduction of graphene oxide, it it lowers the defects, and then you see there is a peak uh, shift, which can be assumed that it can there's a change in thickness for this uh, graphene oxide layer that that will I will describe later. So <clears throat> when you uh, go to the time and index analysis of graphene oxide, uh, you see that uh, I mean there is carbon content is almost 90 percent with oxygen very high oxygen content. Obviously, there are some impurities there, but still the content of oxygen is quite high. But after you re reduce the graphene oxide, you see that uh, <clears throat> this uh, the carbon ratio increased significantly to almost 99% with oxygen 1.22%. 1, 1 and here, even you see that after you, you reduce the graphene oxide filler, you see that uh, thinner graphene flakes with superimposed stacking of hexagonal graphene rings. And then you see that there is, after the, the reduction, our graphene... Uh, exhibited some crystalline structure, which is very pertinent when you're dealing with the thermal conductivity of composite system. Moreover, in the SEM images, uh, there is a difference between reduce and uh, graphene oxide uh, filler. So when talking on the PVA-based polymer system, we see that uh, <coughs> as we uh, increase the concentration of our uh, uh, filler, like 5 to 10 percent, and with the uh, reduced graphene oxide, we see the increase in uh, water contact angle, which is very important when you are dealing with uh, uh, I mean, short circuiting and especially corrosion in, in electronic devices. However, in atomic force microscopy, here you can see that our uh, system, I mean, graphene oxide had average thickness of almost 0.5 micrometer, but after the reduction, it reduced to 0.1 micrometer, showing a decrease in significant thickness. It also confirmed the successful uh, reduction process. So going into the thermal connectivity, we say that our system exhibited extraordinary thermal connectivity 5.1 watts per meter Kelvin with just 10 weight person uh, DEG-based PVA system. So uh, even so, what's the mechanism for that? Mechanism is that uh, after you reduce it, there is a reduction of defects and functional group. So when you are reducing the functional groups like OH groups and carboxy group, you are actually uh, <clears throat> making uh, the graphene flakes uh, more to in towards each other for vulnerable forces. And moreover, our system also had improved filler dispersion with the polymer system. <clears throat> Whereas if you talk about electrical resistivity, need PVA served as an electrical insulator, 
uh, have a volume resistivity of 9.3, 10 to raise per 11 uh, ohm centimeter. Whereas our 10 weight person graphene oxide PV system has electrical resistivity of almost 10 to raise to 4. But if you uh, reduce the filler, you see that there is a like, slight decrease in electrical resistivity to approximately 8 into 10 per raise 3 ohm centimeter. So this reduction can be possible. This reduction of uh, electrical resistivity can be due to the removal of these hydroxyl and carboxyl groups from graphene oxide and the reduction process uh, by, uh, by DAG with more carbon content, as mentioned before in the ADS analysis. So conclusion of the after second chapter, reduction of graphene, decreased thickness of graphene flakes, uh, very high thermal conductivity achieved a lower weight percentage, increased non vertibility oh, sorry. So my third chapter includes uh, more of underfill materials. It's based on thermal set material of CNT based boxy master batch nanocomposite, which deal with thermal and electrical properties. <clears throat> so we uh, prepared this system in which three master batches of carbon nanotubes were utilized to manufacture electrically and thermally connective epoxy nanocomposite at very low weight percentage of 0.5, 1, and 2 weight percent using a scalable processing rule. So we employed three, three kind of uh, uh, master batches from the industry. One is multi wall carbon, carbon nanotube one. The other one is like multi wall carbon nanotube two. The other one is single wall carbon nanotubes. If you see the aspect ratio, you see that uh, single wall has the highest aspect ratio compared to the other two. <clears throat> and these uh, master batches with different CNTs have, are produced with different processing metal, like three roll milling, extrusion, and mechanical mixing. So here we see that once we uh, one, once we bought the mass uh, batches, we diluted with very very weight percentages, and then we used different uh, mixing matter to have like two kind of specimens. One is used for thermal conductivity measurement; the other one is used for the uh, resistivity samples. Here we see that when going into thermal and electrical conductivity, uh, there is an increase of thermal conductivity as well as decrease in electrical resistivity when you are increasing the weight percentage of all of them. But the best uh, thermal conductivity is was shown by the single wall carbon nanotubes of, of almost 0.5 watts per Kelvin with just two weight percent uh, pillar content. So we can, hence we can say that single wall composites outperform the multi wall composites in, in both cases. So what's the mechanism for this thermal conductivity? So here we see that in single world, it has obviously high aspect ratio, which is very important for thermal conductivity enhancement. And moreover, it is highly uniformly dispersed in epoxy system. And where you see that, here you can see that there is, there is like efficient connecting pathway for connecting channels of uh, carbon nanotubes to carbon nanotubes. And then the carbon nanotube bridging effect with epoxy resin for the effective transfer of heat in the polymer system. And then what happened, it decreased the overall interfacial thermal resistance, also called that capital cell resistance between themselves and the polymer system, which immensely enhances the thermal connectivity. So when you see, talk about thermal stability, we say that at 10 weight person thermal uh, weight loss, we say that this uh, compared to uh, plain epoxy, our two weight person single bar carbon nanotubes had the high, highest temperature compared to the other two. Uh, multi board carbon nanotubes. So all composites showed continuously improved thermal stability with increasing filler content. So when you see about the temperature at 10 weight person, you see 1 person goes 18 degrees Celsius, whereas 2 weight person goes increase 35 degree of Celsius of temperature in the world. So when uh, you talk about the glass transition temperatures, uh, we see that there is an increase in glass transition temperature of for almost all composites, but Specifically, there is a significant increase in glass transition temperature from uh, neat epoxy to uh, two weight person single wall at 102 percent, uh, <laughs> which is not significant in other multi wall carbon neon tubes based composite system. So, when you see the comparison of this all of the two weight person uh, uh, CNT based composite system, we say single wall uh, carbon neon tubes, you see there's no agglomerates. And there is highest dispersion interconnectivity, uh, which is basically helps in augmenting the thermal electrical connectivity. This was produced by three more roll milling matter. 
But when you uh, see the multi-wall, two wall one, you see large agglomerates here, and you see the vacant epoxy sites uh, impregnation. So these uh, agglomerates actually acts as a pinning center for the scattering of uh, phonons or heat at this point, and which is uh, not uh, good for our system. So in conclusion, uh, we say the master batches uh, uh, successfully create thermally and electrically thermoset composites. So, and the, the main ratio, that, I mean, the aspect ratio and the mechanical mixing method is very pertinent when you want to achieve this homogeneous mixing, when you want to do this in industry. So now I will come to the overall conclusion of the thesis. So the findings of our study can be summarized as follows. Throughout our experimental process, we emphasize on making the production of TMM more cost-effective for industrial application. As a result, we carefully consider the uh, loading fractions from 0.5 to 10 and the optimal level to 6, 6 to 4 aerogel-based composite, facilitating their incorporation in the polymer like box resin and PVA for the fabrication of uh, this system. And by use different 1D and 2D-based uh, nanomaterials, and then we say that 3D framework of thermally connective boron FI PVA, they demonstrated high, uh, good, I mean, in plane and outer plane thermal connectivity. They achieved like good hydrophobicity, excellent thermal stability, and excellent uh, electrical insulation properties. Whereas when you see that we actually optimize the thermally conductive polymer, the free based polymer system. With just using, but just using like remarkable low failure concentration of 10 weight percent reduced graphene site at uh, to achieve 5.1 watts per meter Kelvin thermal conductivity. So this uh, value is just crosses the industrial uh, uh, thermal conductivity value of watts for, for, per watts per watts per meter Kelvin. So optimization of thermally connective polymer nanocomposites were achieved in contrast to the conventional things that are used in the uh, with high loading failure concentration. Last but not the least, so CNTs based epoxy composite as an underfill material uh, were notably uh, achieved the high thermal connectivity at mere two weight percent single bar carbon nanotube. So the, uh, this dissertation offers a comprehensive analysis of the experiment study conducted on the fabrication of thermally connective polymer nanocomposites and the potential application for various thermal management applications. These are the highlights of some of the of my materials that I use. Now I, I would like to extend my thank to the, my dear professor, uh, Dr. Sergey Maibov, and all the IDC members for their valuable time and feedback, especially thanks to uh, Professor Bakumov, uh, Professor Korsunsky, and uh, Professor late Alexei Bujasanki. Uh, I wish he was here with us, but I, he, she had uh, rest in peace and give good. Sorry, got. And to Professor Albert and all jury members, and support of my family and close friend and to Skull Tech. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so now the talk is open for questions. So, who would like to start? I, I have a question. Um, but it's related to uh, Alexander Korsunsky. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, it's related to your conclusions. So I'm just wondering if it's possible to display the um, presentation again so that we can, I can point out what, what I meant. So, uh, but in words, uh, you uh, argued that relatively small proportion of addition of uh, conductive thermally conductive uh, fibers effectively, um, confers significant improvement of um, uh, overall thermal conductivity. I wonder if you ever tried to plot the degree of improvement of conductivity as a function of loading. Did you show any uh, results like this? I mean, you mean the, like... On the horizontal axis, mm -hmm. weight percent of your additive, on the vertical axis, thermal conductivity of the composite. Yeah, uh, yeah, I saw it in one of the graphs. Okay, maybe we could go back yeah, to that. Yeah, I just yeah, wanted to discuss yeah, what it shows. Yeah. Is it possible to Elena, come back to the presentation? Can we, Elena, can, can you display the presentation again? Because we want to discuss the... Uh, 
Ah, thank you. All right, which slide? Uh, I can go to uh, 40 or something. <coughs> no, no, uh, 30, 36, 36. 36, go back, go back. Uh, 35. No, 35. Uh, I wonder if your pointer works. Try, try moving. Maybe you can move it yourself. Forward, back. Does it work? Okay. Yeah, try. You, you, you find it yourself. Okay. So uh, I wanted to ask you what physical processes and structural aspects affect this curve, which to me looks very much like a straight line. And do you expect any singularities or peculiarities on this curve? curve in other words is it a purely rule of mixture situation which it appears to be or is there something else yeah normally if you deal with the mechanism of thermal connectivity it deals with the uh, i mean if you increase the uh, i mean the concentration of the thermally connective particle size particles like the fiends are highly thermally connective for more than 5000 watts per meter kelvin so if you increase the loading concentration, so the mechanism involved with the lower concentration is different. Like even if you're talking about less than one point weight percent, it talks about the tunneling, tunneling effect of uh, electrons. But at higher weight percentage, there is like a, a construction of thermally connected parts yeah, yeah. here. But uh, hang on, Mohammed. If if it's if there is a change in mechanism, mm -hmm. typically there is a change in the mathematical dependence. Uh, or interrelation between parameters. Mm -hmm. I can't see this change, and I'm just wondering if in your thesis you have considered the percolation threshold mm -hmm. and what happens when that occurs, and is it as relevant to thermal conductivity as it clearly is to electrical conductivity? That's what I would like you to discuss. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, I will come to this question like. When you talk about percolation threshold, graphene has the percolation threshold at very lower weight percentage, like at almost 0 0.3 to 0 0.2 weight percentage. But my idea that if I use this low weight percentage, I cannot get that enhanced electrical uh, thermal conductivity at this weight percentage at 0 0.3, 0 0.4. So by studying the literature, I knew that percolation threshold value is quite low. But in order to uh, develop my system at higher failure load uh, for high thermal connectivity of 5.1. So you need to have high failure loading because in people that they are using more than 50 to 40 to 60 weight percentage. But I don't want that. I want, I mean, the concentration to be quite less than 10 weight percentage. percentage uh, to, uh, sorry. Muhammad, just, uh, I, I want you to hear what I'm trying to say. Look, uh, if it is not just engineering that you're doing, but also trying to touch science, then such uh, phenomena as percolation threshold are very interesting. And the reason they're very interesting is the following, that uh, if you know where it's located and you know the behavior below and above, you possess predictive ability about designing your system. Mm -hmm. Now, what you describe uh, people do with higher loading I suspect is based on simple rule of mixtures. Basically, in order to reach certain value, you need to add more and more, and you can calculate easily how much you need because the expression is very simple. But I'm asking about the scientific uh, context and the interest, because if you say that the percolation threshold is very low, then my next question is, A, I would like to see it, and B, I would like to see an attempt to describe the interrelation in the region in which you operate, which could be below or above percolation, I don't care. But it, I, I, you know, so you show this, and what do I do with this? I look at the bar chart. I'm not a financier. Mm, I I don't, I'm not interested in bar charts. Okay. I'm interested in functions because yeah, functions yeah. give me ability to predict. I I agree with your statement, but the, the but the thing is, the idea was based on the application. I, I could have like uh, shown the percolation threshold value by using very low, I mean, even like even 0.09 to one bit. One bit okay, how but did you determine, what, how did you determine what is enough, by trial and error? No, 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 by, I mean, but by, by reading the literature, um, they said, okay, this kind of uh, material. No, 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 but why did you choose 
five percent, ten percent. Why not so seven? Just, Why not seven point three? Just to, uh, to because we because I know from the literature that the, the percolation threshold value is below this weight percentage. Okay, so but if you have, just uh, want, hang on, hang on, Muhammad, you need to understand this. If you have a target value that you want to achieve. You can achieve it in two ways. Either you do scattergun approach, you do boom, 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 and finally I found something. Or you have some sort of correlation which tells you uh, this is my functional relationship. In order to get enough, I need this much. That's it. End of story. Okay. That's what I don't see. And I don't even see an attempt to approximate this curve by some sort of mathematical function. Okay. Yeah, you're right. I just want to see. And I don't know what it does towards very low concentrations, uh, whether guess... whether in practical terms it's <coughs> linear or whether there is some curve, uh, what the physical mechanisms are. I, I mean, percolation threshold is a point of discontinuity or a point of peculiarity in the sense that your uh, conductivity suddenly uh, increases by a significant amount. What happens beyond percolation? I don't know. I suspect it's some sort of weak dependence compared to this transition, right? But in any case, I would like to see an attempt to describe it mathematically. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Okay. Any other questions? So, if, if you don't have, can can, can, can I uh, ask you? So, I need to ask whether you're satisfied with all the changes which were introduced in the thesis after afterwards. Yes. Okay. Thank I you. was. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, the other questions from the audience. So while uh, people are preparing questions, so the jury members, so let me start uh, with, with the questions. So you uh, deal with the two and one dimensional materials which uh, have very high adhesion uh, forces or Van der Waals, uh, interaction between each other, right? So for example, for carbon ion tubes, to make a good dispersion, you really need to put a huge effort. Uh, so it's, it requires like ultrasonication yes. and, and, and so on. So now you are showing the data uh, when you introduce it, a certain amount of like a carbon ion tubes. Okay, question about carbon ion tube uh, part uh, of your presentation. And um, so, how did you evaluate uh, the uniform distribution of carbon ion tubes? How much do you know that they are really well dispersed uh, in the matrix? I mean, uh, obviously, like by looking at the literature, then by by after you do the, the I mean, the mixing and all the blending, by the SEO images, if you go to the slide, uh, let me show it to you here. Yeah. So here, uh, here you see that the disparity between all of the uh, I mean, same images, all of the yeah system. So here, in single wall, you see that there is a, like uh, uh, for, uh, there is a like connectivity between like carbon nanotubes to carbon nanotubes. I mean, there is like homogeneous dispersion. But if you go to the multi wall, you see huge agglomerates. In the you see it here. And you see the, the epoxy is uniformly, I mean, impregnated inside mix, but you see it is agglomerated. So when you have this, you see that your system thermal connectivity will go down. But compared to this, you see large chunks of agglomerates. So even though, like uh, you, you say that you have this vendor for forces and this, but if, if you do not mix them well, homogeneous mix, because for the R D system, it is used from three roll mixing, then we use like uh, if you go back for it. So, 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 yeah, that's enough. So, you say that uh, you might have a problem with uh, dispersion of carbon ion yeah, tubes, yeah. especially in multi wall. I, I would expect, like, vice versa, because uh, uh, multi wall carbon ion tubes, they have, like, uh, they are easy to disperse yeah, yeah. when compared to single wall. But in your case, I see it's a bit like a different result. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, because the production method was different. For single board, we saw it was three roll mixing technique that the industry used it. They, so so you started with master batch for master single batch. They were already quite yeah, well yeah, dispersed. Yeah. With a multi wall carbon ion tube, you started with powder, right? No, no, no. All of the three were all master batches, but they use different techniques. I just I diluted it with boxing. For example, for yeah, but, yeah, but why do you have so bad result for multi-volt carbon ion tube then? 
I mean, uh, I mean let me uh, see. Uh, okay, uh, you see the single word, it is free roll milling it, for exclusion and it's mechanical mixing. So I feel that for mechanical mixing, what that industry will use, uh, they're going to use it properly, mix it well. Because at such uh, low weight, volume, uh, weight, uh, weight percentage, you need very, very homogeneous mixing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, then if you go to slide number 25, you have shown that you studied the flexibility of your samples, right? Yes. Uh, it's... Oh, yeah. Ah, yes. Uh, sorry, which slide? Uh, 25, please. Yes, so you have demonstrated like a uh, flexibility, but indeed it just, uh, to me, it doesn't show anything. So this is a one uh, flexible cycle. So you flex it, you, re you release it. So it's not a flexibility. Flexibility test means like thousands times. It's uh, like industrial standard. It's like 10,000 times okay. uh, used to be it. So nowadays it's like 150,000 times like a flexible test. After which or during which you are constantly measuring like a properties. Uh, I don't know, like in this case, it would be thermal conductivity. In general, it could be electrical conductivity. Okay. So is that like the demonstration of the flexibility? How you could say it's flexible if you just show only one cycle of fle flexing, of bending? Yeah. I, I didn't perform that. That means that I should have performed that uh, stress strain analysis. Okay, but this is a comment. So the, the, yeah. this is a not demonstration of flexibility. Okay. So one times it doesn't mean anything. Okay. According to like even uh, for research standards, but okay. to say nothing of like industrial uh, things. So could you please comment about the glass transition temperature of carbon ion tubes? Uh, composite materials, yeah. So you demonstrated that when you add some carbon ion tubes, the glass transition temperature goes up, right? Yeah, yeah, it goes up to 102. So, for, for, for like... so what is the reason behind? Why is it? Uh... Uh, maybe it's due to the fact that the single bar carbon ion tubes have high aspect ratio. So when you uh, use homogeneous mixing, it, uh, I mean, it, it 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 prevents the polymer to it it inhibited the polymer segment segmental mobility of the system so and we have the high aspect ratio then the polymer will have great like uh, enhanced electric i mean glass transition temperature compared to the multi they are like very have short aspect expect ratio so that can be a possible reason for that okay. i mean you induce like fibers inside and mm -hmm. then you i mean i mean uh, if you have high density fibers at high expect ratio, uh, you feel that at high temperature, I mean, it, I mean, uh, the conservation temperature is from going from, uh, from uh, the glassy state to the rubbing state. So when you're transforming from that region, you're actually <coughs> impeding the polymer segmental mobility in mm. that sense. So that can be reason for that high expect ratio for uh, interconnectivity with homogeneous mixing. Okay, and then the last uh, question, so which is general, is not related to uh, like any specific slide, but in general related to your PhD thesis. So now you have gone through like different materials, you know, learn a little bit about boron nitrate, graphene, carbon tube, multiple, single wall. So could you describe me what's going to be an ideal material? So if you started now with your knowledge, you need to create a material with the highest thermal uh, conductivity. So what would you start, and could you describe me what would be the ideal material in this case? So, uh, in my case, like if you see the global trend, so people now have transformed from thermal bags to the thermal films. So, in thermal films, you have optimized thickness. So, at certain optimized thickness, let's suppose we have thickness less than one millimeter. You see, research has said that we have like highest thermal conductivity. So, with this flexibility, you are actually replacing thermal pads with thermal films to achieve high thermal connectivity with less thickness. So, I mean, that can be a possibility that these films, even that, even like nowadays, Huawei companies, like, they have used these uh, films in their, in, in their nearest mobile phones. And even 
if you see that uh, new MacBook, they don't use fans now as a heat sink. Even uh, Professor Kurtzunski is using MacBook M1 chip, M1 chip, M2 chip. They are using. They are not using the fans. They are using this thermal film inside. Yeah. So you you are referring again to the like a literature or like no, some, no, somebody's so, research. Yeah, so so, so, so yeah. tell about yourself. What would you take as a material? How would you make it so that you get an idea in your in, with in, your experience based on the yeah, in PhD my, you yeah. did? In my experience, I would prefer that using uh, graphene oxide based PV polymer. I would use highest uh, thermal conductivity. So they are very flexible, they're easy to process, and yet they, they can be used for large industrial processes. Okay, from yeah. the easiness point of view, graphene oxide yeah, cannot be competed with any other material. How about the performance, the electric, uh, the thermal conductivity? How, how would you create, uh, how you would engineer, how would you design your material in, in case of uh, uh, thermal uh, electrical uh, uh, yeah. properties? Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, yeah, in, in, in some part of, of the thermal management applications, uh, you need highest electrical insulation. But in some part, even a moderate electrical, electrical conductivity doesn't affect the system mm -hmm. when it deals with short circuiting. So that can be employed in that particular system. So I'm, I'm basically focusing on that because in uh, if you, even people have used... Uh, well, still, you, you're answering like very general. I would like to, to hear the really specific thing. So you now got a, a task to produce very uh, like efficient from a thermal conductivity point of view material. What would you do? I would use not, not, not the efficient, not the uh, easiest one like graphene oxide, but a very efficient one with the highest thermal conductivity. Efficient one, I would also prefer to graphene. Also graphene, graphene oxide. Graphene, graphene because Graphene has the highest, because I work with all of them, but uh -huh. graphene has the highest thermal conductivity at 5,000 watts per meter Kelvin, even like more than, I don't even, uh, more than CNTs, like, yeah. because they have more surface area. Uh, I mean, surface to volume ratio is quite high for graphene compared to the carbon nanotubes. And it's, I, I, it has more contact with the polymer system to have this effective bridges for the transfer of like heat. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I'm. Uh, also, um, as a chair, I, I have to say that I'm satisfied with all the changes which were introduced in the thesis so, uh, during the revision. So, and uh, so any, anybody else would like to continue ask questions? So, so can I have some questions? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, okay. Good. Who is speaking? Mm. Uh, so this is Jin Zhao from China. I'm in Beijing now. Okay. Uh, okay. From the, the, the China. I attend the um, Center for Letter Science and Technology. Okay. Uh, actually, I, I have th uh, three questions. Uh, before that, I, I want to say, uh, yeah, so hi, hi, Alice, long time, Lucy. Hi, <laughs> okay. hi, hi. Uh, so, I, uh, so, first of all, the, for the changes, I, actually, I, I found that for the question two of the first uh, review, uh, the, the review asked the, your comments on the influence of uh, temperature on the uh, on the water contact angle, but uh, you you answered uh, uh, you answered by saying something about uh, the the surface tension. I think uh, can, can you give some comments on the influence of temperature on the uh, surface tension and uh, uh, water contact angle? Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Chow, yeah. for for yeah. your question. Yeah, as far as mm -hmm. that question is concerned, uh, because mm. the question was asked about uh, like. Uh, because mm. I use that uh, for like uh, my films for me in the water contact angle at room temperature. Mm. So the question that mm -hmm. if you increase that temperature, what will be the effect on the, uh, I mean, the variability of the system? But in our mm -hmm. case, uh, I mean, uh, two of the mediums are solid and, and water. It's not like water and water and water liquid. In that case, it's very difficult. We have our system where if you have two, uh, uh, two systems, like one is liquid, the other is liquid, and then you can increase the temperature at certain chamber. But when you have system, mm -hmm. when you have films, then you have that uh, water droplet on, and, and when you're increasing temperature, it's not possible it's in that kind of system. So it's a very, very good, uh, I mean, uh, comment. Maybe in the future, I will just, just like uh, take this uh, point into consideration and improve my research. Thank you. Okay, good. So, so for the second question, uh, it's concerning the uh, thermal stability of the BMPV com, letter complex. For for that one, 
I note that for the for the complete of uh, boron nitride P and PV complete, uh, the uh, when the temperature uh, is uh, is at uh, is already uh, at about uh, uh, 800 degrees C, uh, there was a still very little a loss of weight. Uh, I, I, first, I want to know uh, what's the ratio of the fin to the matrix for that uh, sample, and uh, how can can it uh, uh, behave like that at a, such a high temperature of 800 degrees C is really too high for the polymers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you for the yeah. question. Professor, that for our system, we use two to one ratio of like B and, uh, and, and PVA. At that, uh, mm -hmm. we constructed a segregated PVA BN structure in which mm -hmm. one part is like interconnected with BN and cells and other are polymer segments. Maybe I mean, I mean that stability at that time. I mean, obviously the, the I mean the thermal stability of boron that right, it, it it's beyond 800 degrees Celsius. It's very highly thermally stable. But when you have a segregated structure of uh, BN, I mean, when you measure the thermal conductivity testing, you don't like put all the of the material like there's some part like left. So, mm -hmm. uh, so, so what, what's the what's the ratio of that uh, sample? It's a it's, nine to one. Or, or, it's, or? That one is two into one, two into one. Two to one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but for me, it's really, that, that is the most stability is really, um, yeah, out of yeah. my uh, expectation, I think. Okay. Uh, maybe you can check it later. Uh, uh, this. Okay. Uh, so the, for, the, for the third one, and actually for your work in China, uh, it's a, a four, four years ago, uh, you did a really a great job. And uh, your publication in the in the complete part A uh, has got uh, about uh, uh, two hundred times citations. For that system, I think it's really uh, successful. And uh, for that system, you use the uh, microfina of uh, short carbon fiber, and also with the little uh, thinners of uh, um, a graphite little platelet, and also uh, a boron nitride. And so. I just wonder, uh, for for your for the current system that you are studying uh, during your PhD study, uh, what's the advantages uh, of your uh, current system uh, over that system in China, and uh, and also uh, is there uh, are there any uh, disadvantages for your current uh, sample systems? Uh, can you have uh, some comments? Thanks. Okay, but, uh, uh, for, for that uh, for that work uh, yeah. for the uh -huh. thermal fillers, like I use hybrid fillers with the use of mm -hmm. boron nitride, graphene, and short carbon fiber. So yes. I, after that, I still feel that if you have more number of uh, fillers inside the polymer system, you have more interfaces. So when you have mm -hmm. more interfaces, there is like uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there is a lot of thermal resistance at uh, I mean I mean at the interface between the polymer and the filler. So when you have multiple interfaces, there is a sort of, uh, I mean, possibility there is more scattering of uh, I mean uh, phonons or that uh, that particular setup. So I feel that I mean uh, when I did that research, I should go to a single two uh, D material that mm -hmm. will have simple interface. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 other than random uh, multiple interfaces. That was also suggested by Professor Chang to should focus on single material. So that's why I use uh, this graphene, and then I I can use different ways by aligning or orienting in one direction, and then you can just uh, self-assemble. And by the way, even enhance this like uh, uh, propagation of heat and have make uh, conductive channels, and uh, in this way you can have this increase in conductivity. So now in this case, like uh, uh, approximately 5.1. Watch for Mr. Kelvin at 10 bit person is, is I think it's a good good result. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I have a little more question. Thanks. Thank you. For... So, yeah. pro Professor Zhao, so could you please uh, comment whether you're satisfied with the changes made in uh, thesis? I, 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 I almost satisfied with that, but with only one, uh, that's the, the, the question I, I also already taught um, with uh, Aris for the, for the question two of a review one. For others, I, I think it's okay. Yeah, I, I can accept the, the changes he has made. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah.
in the problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, any other questions? May I have asked a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Please, uh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I was concerned about the summer stability because uh, I think it's it's quite important for uh, thermal management materials. I see just uh, as uh, Professor Stone mentioned that uh, 800 is quite uh, high for, I mean, for the metal composite because there, I see there is almost no mass loss until 800. Uh, have you tried other contents? Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, have you count, uh, tried other uh, uh, BN contents? B? I will other mirror. No, I didn't, yeah. I didn't. I didn't check the other BN content. I just wanted to check the. I mean, the best one, because most of them they were having the same uh, uh, thermal stability. Because uh, as I said to Professor Chow, that our my system was. Uh, B and PV is segregated structure. I mean, PVA polymers and BN are segregated from each other, and then they make this thermally conductive channel. So in that case, you feel that maybe, I mean, the polymer content may become, when I was testing the thermal uh, stability testing in that case, or, but still like, uh, uh, I can, I, I, I okay. forgot the question. Okay, okay. Uh, the, my, last, my last question is about the CNT. Uh, can, uh, suppose that uh, you have lead composite reinforced by uh, multiple carbonate tubes with a uh, uniform dispersion. Uh, can you expect, uh, um, is there any difference between, I mean, the thermal conductivities of uh, uh, SW, I mean, single wall carbonate tubes reinforced and the, um, multiple carbonate tubes reinforced lead composite? Do you expect any uh, difference? Uh, which one is better, do you think? I'm sorry, I didn't get your question full, but I will trans try to answer that you are saying that the thermal connectivities of both of them are different. Uh, so can you please repeat your question? Yeah, I, I mean, suppose you have a com uh, lead composite reinforced by multiple carbonate tubes with a beautiful version, just like uh, you have uh, obtained uh, for uh, I mean, single wall carbonate tube reinforced lead composite with a uniform dispersion. <laughs> I mean, uh, do you think there is any difference for the MWCNT reinforced or under this uh, single word carbonate reinforced that mm -hmm. comes it with uniform, uniform disper uh, dispersion? Suppose they both have good dispersion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, obviously, um, uh, dispersion. Uh, it, it's a very pertinent thing when you talk about the processing of polymer composites. But in our case, like uh, the single word carbon nanotubes were taken from uh, I mean, three roll mixing matter. And then they were uh, this, this master batches. I took the master batches, then I diluted it. But with the multi word carbon nanotubes, the industrial, they gave me like uh, mixing, um, mixing I mean, I mean, uh, high speed mixer. And so I got, uh, uh, I, we bought that uh, uh, master batches, single word and multi word carbon nanotubes, master batches. Then I diluted it by using different like um, uh, machines uh, like uh, prop sonication, bus sonication, and these are the systems. So uh, they differ, differ with the mixing. I mean, the structure, the morphology is different for everyone. Okay, yeah. My question, uh, yeah, that's all my question. I think the, uh, my comments has been changed. Very good, yeah. I have no more comments. Thank you. So, Professor Leo, so I also need to ask you whether you're satisfied with the changes made in the last version of the thesis? Yes. Yes. Okay. I thank think you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Oh. And, and yes. Okay, uh, it's uh, my order, uh, I think, uh, ask questions. Yes, please. Uh, uh, it's Igor Shishkovsky and uh, Please, could you open the slide number uh, 17? Actually, I have uh, three main questions and I start uh, from the third question, 17. It's not working. 
there is a button which blanks the screen and you press it with a bird. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. One of them. You're talking about this one. Oops. Maybe, maybe if you press both of them, so there's some, there's some sort of a regime in which you. Okay, yeah. That you mean? Okay. Maybe if you press it. I'm just checking if it's. Yeah, if you press this for a long period, then it scores. You, if you inadvertently press this for too long, it, it switches it off. Oh, okay. If you press this for longer, it goes back. It goes back. Thank you, Professor. Okay, note 17. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Thank you. My questions was connect with uh, uh, XRG um, patents, and uh, I ask you present informations about the initial materials, polymers, boron nitride, and the mixture which you prepare. Just now, no. I see you present such informations, but actually, uh, I still uh, were not clear next things. Could you comment uh, me what's happened with uh, polymer when you present uh, the diffractogram for the uh, mixture polymer with boron, uh, the peak of the polymers, uh, it's uh, disappear. What's happened with him? Yeah, here, here Professor, you see that uh, this is a peak for the pure PVA, like, like you mentioned, you have to, uh, like, like, like you commented before that I have to mention it. So this is, uh, I mean, the fraction peak for pure PVA, whereas for uh, pure BN, you see the fraction peaks at 100, 0, 0, 0, 4, and 0, 0.2. So when uh, we, we feel that when you have the segregated structure of BN, PVA with more BN content, so there is like, uh, I mean, the disappearance of this uh, diffraction peaks to some content. So, uh, I mean, and you see that, feel that there is like a slight orientation uh, to, to some different orientation by using the self-assembly. So, I mean, even though that our system is a segregate, segregated structure of PV and BVA, BN, so you not might see the uh, peaks of PVA inside uh, the RBN composite system, but still it shows the disappearance of the peak, which uh, we can say that there is can be orientation of this uh, BN platelets of the horizontal position. Actually, it's not clear for me, but uh, you have uh, the polymer matrix and uh, you uh, should prepare a diffractogram uh, for any angles. And uh, this peak, I say about peaks uh, one, zero, one, it's not uh, disappear in the mixture polymers with boron nitride. It's uh, maybe stills, maybe more uh, higher levels, but it uh, should be present on your diffractogram. Okay, okay, but, but it shows like... And, it's, and it, it's very, very strange. Maybe another comment you have. Uh, but, but I was uh, re reading the literature and uh, they say that, okay, if you have this uh, peak uh, enhancement or in uh, I mean, de degradation, you see that the orientation of because here you see that these are the fraction peaks of this, uh, it depicts the uh, orientation of the of the of your platelets at certain direction. So when they are disappeared and the intensity is high, then you see that there is like a slight uh, shifting, uh, there is a slight change in other orientation compared to. So we feel that there is all horizontal orientation of this pin platelet, which uh, I mean, I mean supports that uh, mechanism that we involved in the same analysis. I think it's uh, maybe in our explanations uh, from my mind, I maybe uh, consider that your crystallinity, uh, actually this peaks, uh, it means that your polymer have same uh, crystallinities and uh, it uh, will be decreased after the prepare such mixture and uh, you have more amorph parts of uh, polymers. Uh, only such explains I could be okay. discussed here. Because of uh, deg degradations of your polymers, it means your polymer matrix uh, will not be, um, have um, 
form your matrix uh, degradations, it means uh, degradations where properties of your samples. Okay. Okay, my uh, second question is connect with uh, dependence of vitability from the uh, temperature. You co recommend me that uh, it will be uh, improved in your future research and you will be conduct in the future the temperature dependence of vitability. Uh, can you very shortly describe uh, for me uh, maybe one, two phrase how you plan uh, to measure such uh, dependence of vitability from the temperature yeah, for your samples? Yeah, thank you for the comment. Yeah, specifically for the research, we gave a very, very valid point that when you, for example, we tested our sample at room temperature. So at when you will, when we will increase the temperature, let's suppose to 60 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees, degrees Celsius, because practically, uh, I mean, uh, electronic system, when they are heat up, they're actually gone to this temperature to 60 to 90 degrees Celsius. So what will happen at that point? Will the system will be vertible? <coughs> partial vertible or non vertibility so everything should be taken into consideration so that was a very valid point that, that i thought maybe in the future i will employ this because nowadays in our lab we don't have this facility uh, with to, uh, i mean they, we can only just uh, measure at room temperature we cannot like increase the temperature but maybe in the future um, maybe we can have some uh, in such sophisticated uh, contact angle measurement system we can improve the i mean we can see that i mean the, the results, what will happen that when you increase the temperature, what will happen to the vertibility of the system. So th mm -hmm. that's my idea. Okay, good. And then um, my first questions, and actually it's most general for me questions, connect with the um, problem where heat transfer uh, through the interface of your samples. Uh, well, actually, for example, if you increase the coefficients of thermal conductivity account of the insert same uh, filler in your polymer matrix, uh, what uh, could be happens on the boundary, your samples? Uh, how you can comment uh, these moments and uh, how could be, for example, from the level of uh, thermodynamics, uh, how you consider the mechanism, the temperature transfer from the boundary between your samples and around media. It's maybe gas media, it's maybe liquid media, different media. Yeah, I think you are talking about the uh, coefficient of thermal expansion in the polymer system. When you're talking about like polymer epoxy resin, it has some different coefficient of thermal expansion. When you talk about the filler, it has different. So, uh, so the idea was that uh, to develop such system in which you, uh, I mean, uh, by using this interface, uh, you can, uh, I mean, uh, transfer, I mean, uh, the, the, the transfer the heat or phonons. Um, at, 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 so in the inter interface is just like a nanometer like thickness. So either you, uh, I mean, it acts as a bridge, bridging effect to transfer the heat or it scatters the uh, phonons or the heat or it can be absorbed. So um, so it can be like in the future, like for, if you want to have some applications <coughs> where, the, where you need to check like for coefficient of thermal expansion, then then this is like, it's a good, a good like thing to talk about, to research. Mm -hmm. Actually for me, um, it's not clear next things. Uh, okay, you have increased coefficients of the thermal conductivity, but uh, the thermal resistance on the body, uh, has leverant and uh, all your efforts improvement it uh, will be not results and uh, when what's in the point of your works yeah, uh, yeah yeah professor that is the point that you improve the so, so at the interface you have this interfacial thermal resistance so you are more if your if your uh, filler and metric metrics are not compatible uh, they are not like they, are, they have not enough uh, I, mean, I mean chemical bonding you cannot transfer the heat effectively 
So if you cannot transfer the heat effectively, there is lag in phase thermal resistance. So you need to reduce the thermal resistance. It's called capacitor resistance to improve the thermal connectivity of the system. So the idea was to use different mechanism for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Professor Shishkovsky, could you please uh, let us know whether you're satisfied with the changes introduced in the thesis? Yes, I am. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. And I think that so every member expressed the um, uh, attitude, uh, asked questions. Now the question from the audience. Is there is anyone to ask? Anybody else would like to ask questions? So if not, then the next word should be given to the supervisor. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank you, uh, join Mohammad in thanking you uh, for the help with this work. First of all, for jury members and IDC committee members for joining the committee and for your criticism, uh, which I believe um, really made uh, scissors better. A special thanks to Professor Bakumov and Professor Karsunsky, uh, who spent a lot of their precious time uh, helping Muhammad with the characterization of materials and other several questions. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, now back to the topic. I uh, find the topic is that it is on the edge of science. And what is even more important, it is of uh, huge practical importance because to the best of my knowledge, um, industrial companies are working on particular on IRA gels, uh, whether they're working in parallel, in parallel direction, not who knows, uh, but due to some rumors, they are working in on uh, IRA gels uh, to achieve uh, similar goals. Um, so it's of huge practical importance. I was very glad uh, when four years ago Mohamed uh, joined the team. Uh, during these four years, uh, he uh, showed himself to be a hard worker, right? Um, I find uh, his uh, results uh, scientifically significant and novel, and what is again important, uh, practically ap applicable, um, which is also uh, supported by uh, his very good publication records uh, exceeding the PhD requirements. And I fully support uh, Muhammad in today's defense. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Sergey. So um, now there is a closed deliberation. So, Elena, how do we arrange it? So, first of all, we need uh, to ask Muhammad and Professor Abayimov to leave the room. Uh, for the jury members attending online, I will be able to open a breakout room in several seconds. So, we had a, a long discussion with the jury members uh, concerning uh, the, your PhD. So, uh, everybody admitted that uh, the PhD done in a very high scientific level. Uh, it has a uh, high number of uh, papers and uh, basically fulfill all the requirements. Uh, however, according to the voting, uh, so there were two uh, jury members who wanted specifically um, amend uh, some um, comments uh, to, to, to change uh, your thesis. So basically the final decision uh, is a pass with a minor revision, but anyway, it is pass. So I congratulate you, so very good, but uh, you will be given two weeks to, to, to answer like a couple of questions. Uh, Thank so, you. For yeah, but basically, so I, I, I'm very happy. Thank so you. congratulations. Thank you so much. Bro. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very, very much for everyone, especially, specifically uh, Professor Nasibulin, and my special thanks to special thanks to Professor Korsunsky. And without his paper, I would be like. And special thanks to Professor Bakumov, and special thanks to Professor Alexei Buchachanki. He did a great part in improving my. And he was the one person that I wish he was here with us. I got emotional. I just heard the news about his demise two days before. 
but uh, because he was the one who was like taking the annual reviews and everything from the day one and uh, it was like sad news but overall like my journey to the score tech was uh, when i came here in 2019 uh, it was the start of the covid so for the one whole year like the score tech was closed for experimental work so then after one year i started working in the labs after four months <clears throat> my mother got seriously sick and uh, i had to travel back home then i stayed there for like six months then i came back uh, it was a uh, not a good journey like but still i managed to i didn't waste my time i managed to get some book chapters and um, review papers there but uh, Still, like I would like to thank uh, Sergey Bimov, like he supported me. I mean, in that sense, I mean, moral support was a great thing at that time. I didn't lose hope. Even Skoltek was said to me that if, even that you cannot borders are closed, you cannot come back home. But at the last moment, I was there. Then I came back. I got married on the Zoom. <laughs> My wife was stuck there. She came back. Just before one day before the pre-defense, I became a father. I was in the hospital the, the whole night and my pre-defense didn't go well at that time. But after that, I, with the help of uh, really helpful Professor Krasunsky, Bakumov and Alexei Prasajanki. And special thanks to Sergey Baimov, like really like it was a good journey. So thank you, Skoltex, especially I would like to thank uh, the education department. They are very, very good professional and they really help you all out. So thank you, thank you everyone.